Honestly, I think those words come from the songs that you have been singing or we have been singing here. Yeah? Uh, the first time I heard the song, it strikes me deeply that these uh, words uh, has a lot of meaning. Uh, it is not just a song to be sung and then we forgot about it. Yeah, that's why I, I tend to call it an anthem rather than a song. That you kind of, you know, uh, internalize it and then try to behave the way you sing it. Uh, it has a meaning to it. Yeah? So out of the, f of the many uh, words in the lyrics, I think these are the four very essential ones. If you want to talk about leading, uh, Khalifa, in a sense, is a leader. And everybody in IUM, in that sense, a leader. Every Muslim is a leader, right? And that leader will need to lead the change, right? And before the leader can lead the change, they must have the trust. The trust of God, the trust of people, and the trust of themselves, you know? So without the trust, it's difficult to lead because nobody would want to follow you. So building the trust becomes an important uh, work that we need to do so that at the end of the day, we work on, on the basis of trust rather than anything else. Not reputation, not money, but it's a measure of trust. Once the trust is there, I think everything else can flow quite easily and makes a leader more influential in that particular sense. Where does this trust come from? It comes from knowledge. It comes from ikra. It's something that you need to reflect, something you need to think of, you know, uh, which now gives a meaning to this whole amana thing. Yeah? And the song says about the culture of ikra. It is a culture. In other words, part and parcel of our lifestyle, part and parcel of our habit, you know, that it is second nature to us that we need to seek knowledge and be informed about it. And when this all culminate into one thing, then we can talk about the rahmatan lil alamin. And it's not just for you. It is for the entire world, the entire universe, the entire humanity, that your duty is beyond what you know as far as university is concerned. So that comes a very good kind of a, a reminder that these four elements every morning or every day you need to ask, am I the leader? Yeah? Uh, do I have this amana? Uh, have I been reflecting or you know, uh, practicing this ikra thing? And am I leading to this uh, Rahmatan Lil Alamin? We happen, Alhamdulillah, now it's almost like a buzzword. Everybody talks about Rahmatan Lil Alamin. I think the manifestation is on various levels. Yeah? Uh, when I, I understand Rahmatan Lil Alamin is to start first of all with yourself. You must be first of all at peace with yourself. I do believe if you want to make peace, you must be peaceful with yourself first. You must understand what peace is, then you can dispense peace. You know, if you do not understand what peace is, or have never experienced peace, then you cannot dispense peace because you do not know what it is. So you must start, I think, with yourself, how to be peaceful with yourself. And this is where I think the Rahmatan Lil Alamin exceeds its boundary. You know, so from then I think then you can sort of uh, dispense and tell people what peace is all about. And people will believe you because they know that you have gone through this. It is not a word that comes out of a book or a textbook or something that you, know, you pick from somewhere, but it is internalized and it really shows. If you internalize something, it really shows that you've undergone through the experience of a peace of something of that nature. In my case, I think when I start uh, in, in, in UIM, anywhere in this particular case, I will always start with the, with the value of trust. You know, uh, I don't judge people as such. They come to me and I trust them. And I hope they will trust me as well. And that's where I think we, we begin to work on that basis of trust. So for example, uh, my officers here will tell you that I, I seldom supervise them. You know, because I trust them. Uh, if I don't trust them, then why do they need to be around me? You know, uh, so I, did, I seldom supervise them. I believe they have got the honor and the amana uh, to do the work. You know, so uh, that after a while becomes a badge of honor. Uh, now that I trust you and you trust me, then I need to live by that trust. I don't want to violate the trust. You know, so immediately you become a very disciplined person because you want to live by that trust and you want to honor the trust. 
and that becomes a, a hallmark. And after a while, it becomes your second nature, and after a while, it becomes you. So this is how I think it works. Uh, it's difficult to talk about uh, the way we do now, uh, that you must uh, follow certain instruction. Then I, make, I want to make sure that you follow this instruction. So I will begin to supervise you. Some people will able to micromanage you. you know, so suddenly people feel, hey, if you don't trust me, then what am I here for? You know, so I think since in this university we are all Muslim, it's easy to understand this. That I trust you and therefore that it becomes your honor uh, to live by that trust. And that's how things flow. So when the trust is broken, then I think it's something that we need to think about uh, at a different level. How do you deal with this? Certainly, I think trust goes beyond uh, just words, it goes into action at the same time. I mean, the, for example, if this university we work on trust, then we don't have to have a punch card. Because everybody will come here at the time appropriate for them to come. You, know? you don't need even supervisors. You know, because they know that we are, you know, when to come and, you know, because that's, that's the trust that we do. And this is what we see in places like Japan. They don't have supervisors, quote unquote, uh, to a certain extent that they are trusting themselves uh, to take on that duty that they were given to them. So in this particular case, uh, we, we look at it, or I look at it in terms of uh, what is a symbol all about? You know, uh, for me, uh, if you look at the logo of the university, is it a Quran? The Quran uh, speaks all these four words that I was talking to you, uh, the, the Khalifa, the Amana, the Ikraq, and the Rahmatan Lil Alamin. is all in that, you know. And therefore, that is a symbol uh, that is more meaningful to me than any other symbol. If you were to talk about the university per se, unless you want to talk about the university in a different dimension, uh, then the, the question will be a different one, right? The educated person is a person who has experienced Rahmatan Lil Alamin. It is not about scholarship in the sense of degrees. It's not about that piece of paper that all of us are running for, chasing it, you know. Uh, half of the time, people who, are, who have graduated and have this piece of paper, uh, sometimes they are not educated because they don't have the experience of this peacefulness within them. And I go back to the Fasafah Pendidikan Kebangsaan, which says at the end of the day, the Fasafah Pendidikan Kebangsaan say they want to nurture a balanced human being. All right? And if you read further on, they go to this balanced human being must have got what they call kesejahtera and diri. You know, that will be the essential part of an educated person. Dirinya sejahtera, in other words, he has experienced this rahmatan lil alamin, that I, I think. Uh, and, and it's beyond just that piece of paper. So my father, probably your father, who have not gone to school, they are educated. You know, so this whole idea of educating, uh, getting, getting degrees is a, is a modern concept of education. What, are, what, what happened when there was the days when there was no school? Are those people all uneducated? What will be the time of the prophet? Prophet does not go in his school. Uh, you know, no schooling as such. Is he uneducated? So I think, I think you need to understand this word education uh, has different meaning in different civilization uh, to a certain extent that uh, it has sometimes corrupted this whole idea of, of education just based on credentials. And we are all running for credentials now, so much so that we forgot who we are as a human being that need to experience this just kesejahtera and diri. Uh, rather than you know just getting that piece of paper, getting a job, and you think you are done. I, I don't think so. No, no. That's why we don't translate it, and that is this is, is another problem. You know, uh, between cultures, uh, there are certain words that cannot be translated. The moment you translate it, you lose the meaning. 
you know. So that's why I think language is also very important. Arabic, for example, I, I'm not good at Arabic, I don't know Arabic much, but certainly the depth of words in Arabic is a lot more than any other words that you can imagine. Yeah? So you don't translate it because it takes the culture and the value of where the word belongs to. Well, to, to seek knowledge is to allow a kind of a creativity, is to allow a kind of independence, you know. Uh, and that is the fundamental about seeking knowledge, right? So in other words, you're allowed to explore. There is a room for you to try and make errors and make mistakes. That is what learning is all about, yeah? You cannot learn without making mistakes. So, in other words, you must have that flexibility of, of trying and making mistakes, you know. And that flexibility, quote unquote, uh, expresses what autonomy is all about. There is a way to practice it. In other words, there is, there is a, a kind of a process that allows you to practice it in a way that it doesn't violate you know, other principles at the same time. In other words, if you talk about autonomy, uh, it doesn't mean stealing people's work. You know, it could be an, a choice. Uh, if you say explore, I can take your, uh, your, your work and, 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 you know, and plagiarize it. Uh, it sounds like autonomy, but it violates certain principles, certain ethics that we say this is no, no, no longer autonomy. There is a counter boundaries and that's part of education. An educated person will know what the boundary is about, you know, so they know what is the limits that you can push uh, as, far as, as far as knowledge is concerned. So knowledge that harms people probably is not something that we want to uh, encourage. In fact, you do not want to encourage it at all. The gap is basically uh, an issue uh, that impinges on uh, your choice, all right? Uh, for example, if you talk about change, to me, it's a matter of choice. Do you want to change or you do not want to change? Ultimately, you decide. Nobody can force you. Of course, circumstances can force you at the end of the day, but ultimately, you will decide whether you want to change or otherwise, yeah? And that, again, depends on, on, on the kind of education that you get, whether you think this change is right or whether this change is not right. And that's where I think this knowledge thing becomes important. You need to make a decision based on the kind of knowledge that you've got, whether you want to follow this change or not. Nobody can force you uh, to make this change. I mean, this is why sometimes when you talk about change, it's very difficult because you almost need to convince everybody you know, or why the change is necessary or why the change is not necessary. So, but given the circumstances as it is, uh, sometimes if you don't change, then the change will force it onto you. So either you change willingly or you're forced to change. Again, that's a decision that, that you need to make. I mean, technology to me uh, is, a, is a good example as far as I'm concerned. Yeah. Do I need to use a handphone or do I don't need to use a handphone? Uh, my uh, thinking until now, I don't need to use one. And the reason is very simple, because it doesn't change my life in any way. In fact, if I use a handphone, I would be a different person maybe. Because my life has been structured in such a way, I don't need this gadget. This gadget comes in uh, at midpoint of my lifetime. Uh, I also notice now many people have got a wash with a very black kind of a, you know, my wash normally you have the, uh, the, the, the second hand ticking around. Here just a black thing and everybody is using it. And I was thinking, well, if this is a wash, then what are they looking at? You know, <laughs> so apparently it's not just a wash, there's many other things. So do I need that? Well, of course, everybody wants something which is new, to experience something which is new, yeah? But I think at the end of the day, when you experience something new, sometimes it does not last. It's just a kind of a momentary satisfaction that you've got one of this, 
And after that, you know, I don't even wear a wash now. What, what, I'm, what I think I said in the book is basically, if you want to change, you must change for the better. All right? In other words, the choice is good and bad. I mean, you can change for the worse. All right? You must change for the better. And you must change that fits the mission, in our case, this Rahmatan Lil Alamin. If you change and then you get into more stress, and then you're running away from the Rahmatan Lil Alamin, that's not the change that you want. And therefore, you must know what are the, what are the values that you, you're looking at to make that change possible or even to choose for that particular change, you know. So when you talk, when I talk about technology, uh, I will imagine most of this technology will give me more stress than anything else. And therefore, why do I need to invest money in it? That at the end of the day, I'll be stressful. So those are the values. I may be wrong, some people may think this technology is something that, you know, make them more happy or whatever it is, then their decision probably, probably is, dif is different. Depends on what you're looking for at the end of the day. I advocate uh, committee engagement as part and parcel of the Rahmatan Lil Alami. You know, in other words, you need to quote unquote, uh, reach out to other people uh, to share whatever you have with them in the hope that they will also experience what you experience. But in, this, in the same way, you also want to experience what they experience. Sometimes you feel people in, in, in the kampong, uh, they're happier than you are, you know? And they don't have too many things in their houses. And their house is almost bare. But you, when you look at them, they're sometimes happier than you are. We have got so many things around us, but we are still not as happy as they are. And, and, and this, I think, the, 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 the virtue of reaching out to other people, especially beyond the university, to experience what they experience. And therefore, you need to engage them. And that engagement is what I'm advocating, that you need to share whatever you have with them. Uh, that's point number one. Point number two, I think, uh, as we move on, uh, we also want to learn from a different set of values and different sources of knowledge. Now, when you talk about academic, we tend to think about very modern structures, you know, whereas knowledge sources are, are everywhere. Uh, when you look at the, the, in, in the environment, nature as such, yeah, we believe these are the creation of God. We believe these are inspiration from God. Is from, we can learn something from them, provided you know what you're looking for. And therefore, many scientific discovery, for example, comes from just by looking at nature. Comes from just experiencing what they experience in nature. And that's another form of engagement that we want to get into rather than get boxed up in, in, you know, in lecture halls, in, in libraries, uh, even in our own books. Uh, because the whole world is a book by itself. You, but, but you must know how to read it. You know, just like how you want to read a book, you must understand the alphabet. By the end of the day, when you look at nature, you must know what to read from nature so that you can gain the, gain the inspiration at the same time. And that's where I think uh, uh, engagement is important because we are now beginning to be siloed into our own uh, definition of what university is all about. And university for us now is this structure, is this building, uh, but IIUM has got another tagline, the Garden of Knowledge and Virtue. That garden itself is another university that focuses on centers on something else rather than, you know, the building itself. SDG is a response to what we have done wrong. Yeah, 1992 when the first conference was held, it's called the Earth Summit. People are already beginning to ask, uh, why is the world in a mess? We are going back to this whole idea of Rahmatan Lil Alamin, you know? Why is the world no longer peaceful? Why there are so many conflict? Why there are so many poverty? Now, all the things that we've been talking about, 
Uh, people are asking it in the year, in the year 19, 1992 when the Earth Summit comes in. Yeah? Uh, as part of the thinking process, looking for solution, they say we must come into a kind of a, a goal setting. And then in the year 2000, I think they invented what they call the Millennium Development Goal. At that, at that time, we are transiting from the year 2000, 2001. And therefore, the word Millennium becomes very, very handy. So in the new Millennium, uh, they say these are the goals that you need to look for. What is it? No poverty, no hunger, uh, what they call uh, uh, mot uh, instant motel uh, infant mortality must be reduced. All the things that we seem we have done wrong, we want to put it right. All right? And they will uh, allocate 15 years from that. From the year 2000 to the year 2015, the whole world is supposed to you know, work on these eight goals under the Millennium Development Goal, then was called the MDG. By the time we arrived at 2015, when the MDG ended, we find that the problem is not solved. In fact, some of the problem got worse. Yeah? And then they now reinvent the SDG. So the SDG is a response to something that we have done wrong and you want to put it right. All right? Now, it is a convenient uh, platform for us to begin to admit that we need to find a new solution. And that new solution globally is set sustainable development goal. So when we embark and embrace sustainable development goal, the intention, the NIAD is trying to solve problem. Yeah? It is not because uh, we have no other means of doing things, but this is just a, a collectively, globally accepted way of doing things. Yeah? But being a Muslim, that may not be sufficient. Yeah? The Million Development Goal doesn't talk about, say, Makasit Asharia. Yeah? The Millennium De Development Goal doesn't talk about Rahmatan Lil Alamin, which is a higher set of values, a higher set of goals. Yeah? So as we embark on sustainable development in IIUM, we add the idea of Makasit. We add the idea of Rahmatan Lil Alamin. In a way, putting it into a higher pedestal, as a solution to the problem that we are, we are facing today. Because the Sustainable Development Goal do not talk about the human being in a spiritual entity. Whereas Makasit and Rahmat and Lil Alamin talks about it. That's a deficient part as far as SDG is concerned. And when we, embark, uh, when we em embraced it, then we are adding values to it. The 18th, yeah. So once you reconceptualize this into a kind of a spiritual knowledge, then we probably may want to call it SDG 18. I mean, we are still debating about it. Politics and politicians are two different things. Eh? Politics are uh, a way of doing things, uh, you know, uh, but politicians survive on politics. Now, Oftentimes, I think the issue on politics and politician is the issue of ethics. All right, uh, where is the ethical consideration uh, in the fight between power and justice? I think this is what uh, my understanding is. Politicians often, often uh, look at themselves as a person who has power to do things, and therefore, you know, they instruct people and they they get things done uh, by the virtue of power alone. I mean, we can see this every day. Eh? If, if a minister walks in now, all of us will stand up automatically one way or the other. Why? I don't know. If Anuzi just walked in, people don't care. You know? But if Anuzi is a politician, we will, walk, we will stand up for one reason or another. I don't know why. Oh, it depends. It depends on how how you look at it. You know, if you if you were to stand up out of respect, then I think that's okay. You know, but if I stand up because I am forced to, uh, then I don't think it is okay. So it depends on the kind of values that you have. Plus, plus I understand uh, in the context of education, people needs to be humble. That's one of the criteria of being educated. If you start commanding and being arrogant about it, then I think you are not 
in that group of educated person as far as I understand. So my views of, of politician is that dilemma that I have. Where are they coming from? Are they coming in as an educated person with sincere intention of helping? Or are they coming in for the sake of their own power struggle? That they need to be popular, you know? That the people becomes a pawn in their mission to be whatever they want to be. So some politician behave one way, the other politician behave the other way. First of all, we need to understand what AI is all about. All right, AI, AI is just another piece of technology. All right, uh, albeit it's a smart technology, but it is part of human creation. Okay, in other words, when AI works on works on algorithm, who writes the algorithm? I write the algorithm. The AI does not write its own algorithm. You know, so in other words, the worth of AI depends on the worth of the human being. If I'm a good person, I may write an algorithm which is different from a person who has a different intention. So here we talk about AI now. Uh, one of the things that people are worried about is these killer robots. Yeah, killer robots is an AI. It was designed to kill people uh, on impulse that they are given. So they can design, say for example, okay, if you see a person in red, shoot. There's a kind of programming that they put, yeah? Uh, so it really depends on what, what this is all about. Now, my issue is not so much about the AI. When there's something artificial, there must be something which is real. The world is, you know, in, in a balance that way. You have artificial intelligence, then to my mind, there must be some real intelligence. What is that real intelligence? To me, the real intelligence is your fitra. That is what was given to us. We were told in the Quran that, you know, God blows his breath into us, and then we become people who are quote unquote knowledgeable. Uh, in other words, if you want to control AI, you must be able to control yourself first. If you don't know how to control yourself, then you cannot control AI. I mean, the, the, the example has always been made. This is knife. If you, unless you know how to control yourself to use this knife, then it will not be good for you. So understanding AI from that point of view is something that I think we have missed altogether. We look at AI as though it is going to be a destiny that we will all be faced without acknowledging that we are part and parcel of the problem, if not the solution. So AI will not be functional on its own until and unless we decide what to do with it. You have to, because there is no way to, 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 to run away from it, but we must embark in a way that we do not lose our humanity. We do not lose our sense of, you know, uh, being human, we do not lose a sense of being balanced the way that we talked about, uh, and also in the context of religion, uh, why we need to be mindful about it, so that at the end of the day, the AI do not become our next god. You know, some people worship AI in such a way that they forgot uh, what religion and what Islam is all about. Well, this book is just a kind of a reflection that I had. You, 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 you probably will remember I gave my first alikha, and then I gave a second one, and then we combined it. And whilst, while doing that, uh, I am given a mandate to quote unquote, uh, maybe the word change is not uh, appropriate, but to think of how IIUM could move up. Whether it is to change or not, I think we need to decide collectively. But certainly there are new visions, there are new things that IIM can do uh, that wasn't done before. Uh, I, we must, uh, uh, what do you call, admit that the university has grown for 35 years, many good things, particularly this reveal knowledge, human science combination is something which is phenomenal. But what else can what else can we do now? I in this book 
uh, I'm giving the option of what else we can do. And one of the idea was sustainable development because everybody speaks, talks about sustainable development. Uh, it would be very awkward that we have not listened or heard of sustainable development. Yeah? And sustainable development is not, quote unquote, just for the non-Muslims. We also need to be part and parcel of it if you want to talk about humanity as a whole. So this book gives you an option. What did we need to do? What do we not, don't need to do? Do we need to benchmark ourselves? Or do we need to be the benchmark? Well, that's, those, are, those are the choices that we need to make. If we want to be the benchmark, then what is it that we can do that other people have not done? Or if you are so happy just to benchmark others, then it's easy. Just look at other people and follow them. So then you cease to be the leader. So I think that is a debate that I'm trying to bring in that book. Uh, if you want to be the leader, what are the choices in front of you? How much uh, change that you want to make, you know? And how would you undertake this so that you can be visibly distinct? In the book, if you see the word distinctive is there. How can we be distinctive so that people now will respect us for what we believe in accordance to what we think it is important? Back to the Khalifa, Amana, Ikrak and Rahmatan Lillalami. Thank you so much, Tansi, for your time. My pleasure.